Good morning. We're here in the Flow Hive Apiary. It's quite a hot day here. The, uh, we're going to be going through a brood inspection, but also we've just launched the beekeeper.org. So we're going to be talking a bit about that, what it is, and lots of people have got questions about the beekeeper.org. And if you've got questions yourself, put them in the comments below and we'll get to answering them. Also, if you've got questions about beekeeping itself. So I'll go into a little bit what the beekeeper.org is and why we decided to create it. So it's basically an online education portal where we've gathered the, the world's experts in beekeeping to deliver high quality course content for people to learn from. Now when we launched the Flow Hive, we didn't realise it at the time, but what happened was we inspired tens of thousands of new beekeepers. About half of the 70,000 customers we have in their world are uh, brand new to beekeeping. So we quickly realised that we needed to create content to help those beekeepers learn this amazing uh, pursuit. So over the last um, almost five years now we've been creating a lot of online content to help those beekeepers get started but we thought let's take this to the next level. How can we make it better than that? How can we deliver something that's really inspiring to get all of those inspired new beekeepers to, to, to really sink their teeth in to the passion and art of beekeeping. Sorry, we're having a technical problem with no sound. No sound at all. I don't know, some people are mentioning no sound. Are you okay, let me know if you can hear me in the comments below. Let me know if you can hear me in the comments below. Um, one, two, testing, one, two. We've got an audio problem, unfortunately, happens sometimes. Give us the thumbs up if you can hear me and we'll go from there. Looks like... It's the, kind of half and half, yeah. Looks like half can hear the audio and half can't, so that's unfortunate. Um, so we might just... Um, Start the, start the stream again, we'll check the audio and come back. A lot of people are saying sounds good now. Okay, sounds come good. So just a bit of a recap. Today's Facebook live stream is about the beekeeper.org and it's something we launched to help educate so many people in the world who, who are inspired to get into beekeeping and really want somewhere they can get high quality information. We decided to take it a step further from the content that we already create and bring in the experts of the world to, to create content for the beekeeper.org and to, to really deliver high quality online content to inspire people to, to not only get inspired by beekeeping and honey, but even beyond that about bees, about pollinators, about the very matrix of life that we all depend on. So uh, if you're interested, have a look at the beekeeper.org. There is an online special at the moment at 40% off and you can read about it there and see who's involved there and you can try it for free. Now, what we're also going to do today is take the lid off this hive and have a look inside, see how these bees are going. This is a split from this hive here and let's check in to make sure they've got a laying queen and they're doing just fine. If you've got questions, put them in the comments below. If you've got questions about the beekeeper.org or about uh, beekeeping in general, then put it in the comments below. So the beekeeper.org is designed to be beyond flow hives. We keep flow hives. This is my father and I's invention, but of course there's, there's uh, all different hive types in the world. And the, we're starting out with the beekeeper.org to be uh, broader than, than about our invention. So we have, have experts on there featuring Langstroth hives in general. And what you'll find is that whether you're starting with a, um, um, a more conventional beehive or the flow hive, that the course material will be applicable to you. So before taking the lid off the hive, I wanna make sure you are protected to minimize stings. I'm just putting my veil on and doing the zip up. It's important that you zip it all the way up to the centre and make sure 
you velcro it down over the zips. Okay, next thing, have your gloves at the ready. If you're new to beekeeping, wear your gloves as well. You'll need a hive tool and a smoker. Now your smoker, you want it blowing nice, cool smoke. And it's not a bad idea to give your hands a little smoke if you're going gloves, gloveless, just to mask your own smell a little bit. I'm putting the smoker right in the entrance, giving a couple of puffs. It's only a small colony, it doesn't need much smoke. Sometimes they don't need any smoke at all. And that's just to calm the bees a little bit. Now, if you're in a fire prone area, we've had a lot of rain here recently, which is fantastic, but much of the country and other parts of the world, extreme caution when using your smoker. Make sure you light it in a responsible way. If you look up our DPI, they've got instructions on how to do that. The lid comes off. And what you're looking at there is the inner cover. If you've got questions, put them in the comments below and we'll get to answering them. Okay. So I'm just using the chisel end to pry off the inner cover. Now, the queen could be anywhere here because there's no excluder in this hive. It's a, just a single brood box. So I want to make sure we don't orphan her from the hive. If we have a look around here, sometimes you might spot her on the inner cover. There'll be some great uh, material about spotting queens in the beekeeper.org as a, uh, a great learning experience and a learning tool. If you're concerned you might not have seen her or missed her, just lean this up against the, the front of the hive so that she could just walk straight back in the entrance if she needed to. She doesn't fly when she's in egg laying mode. And the reason she doesn't fly is because she's too heavy to actually fly. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is just observe for a second what's going on here. You can see in the middle we have brood frames that are drawn. And when I say drawn, I mean the they, bees have used those frames to, to suspend their honeycomb. And over here we've got some frames that aren't. So I'm going to take out one of the ones that aren't simply because it's easy to get out and the first frame that you pull out of the hive is going to be the harder one to get out. So you can see here we have a comb guide. Now all that is is a little stick at the top and we allow the bees to draw their natural comb from that. My personal preference is not to use plastic foundation in the brood box or wax foundation but it's up to you as the beekeeper you can decide for yourself what you'd like to use. And it's often good to ask around at mentors and clubs and ask what people do as part of getting your education. There's not that many uh, people, I guess, or companies promoting this method. So you also might like to look at the beekeeper.org to, to get some good uh, training videos on what to do and what not to do with naturally drawn comb. So here, I'm being careful not to lay this frame sideways. If I lay this frame sideways, that very fragile new comb might snap off. So that's something different to if you've got plastic or wax and wire foundation in the frame. You can see these bees are drawing it perfectly on the comb guide, which is great to see. They're hanging it off that, that uh, stick that's right in the slot at the top, which is fantastic. And they'll continue drawing that straight now. Sometimes they'll go wonky, so it's good to check your naturally drawn combs, especially when they're starting out, to make sure they're nice and straight. And if they're not, you can push it back onto line. Any questions? Yeah, we, we do. Um, we've got a few questions that are about the inner cover. Um, Luke and Jack are wondering why there is no plug. Okay, great question. So it's up to you whether you want to put a plug in the inner cover. If you don't, they will eventually start making comb in the roof cavity, which may or may not be a good thing depending on what your plans are. You can harvest some honeycomb from up in that roof cavity, or if you're sick of doing that, then you can plug it up so that they don't actually use that 
area, I tend to plug it up because I'd rather they make comb in the frames and put their honey in the flow frames. Brian's a newbie and looking to buy his first hive. He's wondering how the bees are so calm and why they're not swarming all over you. Okay, great question. The genetics of the hive really depend on the behaviour and that genetics is both what the queen has and then the up to 30 or so drones or male bees that she's mated with. And once she has all of that genetic material, she then goes about her life for even up to six years of laying and she won't mate again. And it's that genetic material that depends on the temperament of your hive. If you've got a really aggressive hive that's coming out and hitting your veil like this and trying to get in every sleeve to, uh, to give you a sting, then it could be a good idea to change the genetics of your hive by replacing the queen. So beekeepers will often do that. Um, some will, will uh, go along their apiary and, and mark on the back with a pencil how aggressive they are. And once they've got a certain amount of marks, they will then decide that it's time to replace the queen in that hive. Some people are happy keeping more aggressive hives and just really make sure they're well protected and choose the, the best time of day, mid-morning to mid-afternoon on a nice sunny day and use their smoker to calm the hive down. So it's a bit up to you depending on where your hive is situated. Perhaps if you've got um, a young family around or you're in a close proximity to people, you may want to make sure you've got a, a calm genetics. Best way of starting out to do that is to buy a, a nuke or, or a queen off a queen breeder that already has those calm genetics. Okay. And the other reason is that this isn't a full box of bees either. It's getting there, but the bees aren't completely filling this brood box. Okay, so let's go on to the, the next frame here. So here we have an example of a foundationless frame that's been drawn out even further. They're now connecting it down the sides both sides and the whole thing gets more rigid now. You can see there's some honey up the top, there's some nectar in this frame and that's typical to have, uh, have the honey and nectar towards the outside. We're also starting to see a bit of brood down in this area. If I just gently move some of these bees away you'll see what the brood looks like compared to the honey up here has has more slightly transparent capping and the brood here more opaque and slightly raised. So that's the larvae in their cocoon phase. They're busy cocooning, going through their metamorphosis and soon they will emerge as a, a bee with wings and legs and all of the extraordinary features to allow them to, to fly for up to 10 kilometres to, to get their forage, to get their pollen, to get their nectar. It's such an extraordinary thing and the, the learning never stops in beekeeping. Here I can also see some drones on the frame which is, which is, uh, which is great and they're different to the brood. You can see they stick out in, in, in a bullet style shape. So the drone brood and the worker brood are different in that the drone brood sticks out. So they're the male bees of the hive. There's a lot less of them. In a hive of say 50,000 bees, there might be, there might be 200 to 1,000 drones in that hive. Dana is wondering, is there a place you recommend to buy a queen? The best place to get a queen is from your local queen breeder. The reason why I say local is because they are used to dealing with the, the genetics is used to dealing with the kind of things in your area. The last thing we'd want to do is all buy from the same queen breeder in the world and then we'd have possibly a shortage of genetics. So it's good to go local, look up your, your local queen breeders and um, ask them for, for the kind of traits you're after. You might be after a hygienic, trait which means they keep the hive nice and clean 
and you might be after a, a gentle, gentle strain. But um, others are after a lot of production, so there's, there's a few different traits you can ask for there. Mark would like to know, do you help people out with finding new breeders within their country? Or how do you find bees for the hives? Okay, so we don't supply bees and the best place to get them is locally for the same reasons. So we can, we can certainly help point you in the right direction if you want to write in, but uh, the, the best place is definitely local and the easiest way to start is with a nucleus, which is basically what this hive is started with, which is, um, which is four or five frames from an existing beehive with a queen. And the bees, if you look after them, they'll grow from there. So jumping on to the next frame, keep the questions coming in, there's some great questions. And here is one of the older frames and people often write in and say, is this kind of thing normal? My frame's very dark. Well, Dan Stone behind the camera has spotted Her Royal Highness here, wandering along just in front of my finger. You'll notice that wings just come halfway down her body and the way she walks, she has bigger legs, she moves faster and she moves with purpose. And the bees often are clearing out of the way as she goes. She's a reasonably new queen because the back plate just behind her head is not very shiny yet. The older they get, the more shiny that area as the hair on it rubs off. But she looks nice and big. She's in a good egg laying mode and we can see that because of the, the brood in the hive and the larvae in the hive. So it's a fantastic thing to, to watch her at work. If you spend a lot of time inside hives, you get to see all sorts of really interesting things, getting to watch her lay. The other day we saw her wandering around with an egg actually still attached to her abdomen, which was quite interesting. Here you can see a waggle happening. So this bee here is communicating by waggling. It looks like a grooming waggle. If you see them moving in a circular or figure of eight dance, then that's actually communication that tells the other bees where to go to find the flowers and how far away they are, which is absolutely extraordinary that they can communicate in a hive, in the dark, in amongst thousands of bees and tell really extraordinary and accurate information. Here's the queen up here. There she is wandering around. And she's, uh, when she finds a cell ready to lay in, she'll then dip her abdomen into the cell, which other bees go head first into the cell, and she'll go tail first into the cell in order to lay an egg at the very bottom. Keep the questions coming. Peter says, hi Cedar, I notice you're not wearing gloves. Do you get stung? I've been stung a few times now and I'm developing an increasing sensitivity to the point where I'm thinking of stopping beekeeping. Okay, that's a shame if you've got some serious swelling going on. I'm quite um, used to stings and sometimes it can go the other way where you, you actually get less and less swelling and sometimes you just get hit by a, a bee that hits you in a particular spot or has has more venom than usual and it, and it will swell unusually as well but of course if you've got safety concerns please do look after yourself and we do have safety information on our website now why I don't wear gloves is after a while you get to move in such a way that you're less likely to get stings Having said that, if this hive was showing signs of aggression, I would then put my gloves on. But this hive is just going about its business. None of the bees are showing any signs of aggression. I could probably do this without a bee suit on at all, but I'm not recommending that as a good idea. So it does depend on the genetics of your hive and the experience. Having said that, if you wear gloves, if you don't wear gloves, you'll probably get stung bit more often just by accidentally let's say I pick up this and there was a bee under there I can get a sting on my finger I'm okay with that 
but if you're not, then please do wear your gloves. Ron, just curious how many flow hives we have at the flow office. Okay, there's um, about 20 here right now, just surrounding the, um, the property in various different stages from producing honey, um, a few nucleuses just starting out and a few splits. And that number varies a bit. In springtime it increases a bit as we take splits or catch swarms and then it decreases as, as our staff take those hives home. So we've got a nice cycle going on. Here you can see a bee doing a, a um, what looks like a round dance. So it's moving around in circles and doing the waggle, which is uh, quite neat. The round dance is when the forage is a lot closer to the hive. I just find it amazing. The, uh, the way they can communicate. There's one over here. Benjamin's on the Gold Coast and has just registered their flow hive two with biosecurity. Um, he needs to mark the number on the side of the hive and is wondering what ink do you recommend using and how do you brand your hives? Okay, I believe it's not specified what ink you can use, so it's up to you how strong you want that mark to be. Some people get a, a metal stamp and bash it into the hive, so it's going to be there forever, no matter how many times you paint the hive. Some people heat them up and burn into the wood, and others just write on with a texture or pencil. So it depends a bit on your strategy. We tend to keep it a little more minimal here because we're doing a lot of photography and things with the hives. Rick would like to know how long will brood frame will a brood frame of wax last? So that's a that's a good question. So this frame here has, looks like it's been in use for about a bit over a year, and I'm judging that by the darkness of the combs. The combs get darker naturally over time by the cocoon silk actually building up in the cells of the frame and that will give it that dark texture. The longer it's used the more silk and, and bee footprints and things that build up and it gets darker and darker. So after a couple of years it's a good idea to start cycling those dark frames out by moving them towards the edges, wait till they've got no brood in them and then you can take them out, enjoy eating that honeycomb or, or um, you can if you've got naturally drawn combs, you can cut the, the comb right out in the field and just put it straight back in for them to draw nice, fresh uh, comb in the hive. When it's nice and fresh, it's, it's white or a light yellow colour as the bees produce that wax from their wax glands. Mark's asking, how many bees do you need to start a hive? So, that's a good question. Sometimes you'll catch a really tiny swarm for whatever reason. Uh, uh, the hive perhaps has raised multiple queens in swarm season and uh, a decent swarm might have left and then a small one. And so I'd say the minimum number to start a colony would be a ball of bees, about a handful of bees like this and a queen. They can get going from that, but the more bees you have to start your hive, the better. They uh, when you buy a package of bees from a queen breeder, you'll find they'll have a lot more than a handful of bees in it. And uh, the more bees you can get in your package, if you're ordering a package, then the more likely your bees are to, to get a good start and get going and turn into a, a great colony. Ben would like to know if the bees don't have any pollen when they come back to the hive, does that mean there isn't any nectar as well? No, it doesn't. So some flowers produce nectar and some flowers produce pollen. And bees need a balanced diet in order to be healthy. They need a mixture of, of different flowering plants to collect pollen from because pollen is their protein and nectar is their carbohydrate. So you can get into the situation where bees are bringing in pollen but not nectar and vice versa. If you watch the entrance for a while and make sure you have your, your bee suit on if you're new to beekeeping, then you will see the bees coming in with bright 
yellow or orange pollen on their, their back legs as they fly into the hive. And you want to see that coming in. If you're not seeing any pollen at all, if you're sitting there for, for 10 minutes or so, then they may not be getting enough pollen at the time. Around here, we don't have to feed the bees in any way. There's always something for them, but you may be in an area or perhaps a drought or fire affected area where they don't have access to enough flowers to get enough pollen and nectar, in which case you may need to feed them uh, some supplements. You can feed them sugar as a, as a substitute for nectar, and you can feed them pollen patties for a substitute for pollen. So we've got videos showing you how to make simple feeders in the top of your hive, and there's lots of products available in terms of pollen substitutes also. It's not something I have a lot of experience with, because we don't need to do that in this area. Amber's a first time beekeeper and she said that they just found someone selling Carnolian BSH nukes. Do you think it's better for a first time beekeeper to get Italian bees? She's reading that Italian bees are easier to work with but the Carnolians are varroa resist resistant. Okay, so it's, I would say it's not so much about the name of the breed but more about the genetics of the particular hive. So if, if you're wanting a nice calm hive, then ask for that of your queen breeder. And whether it, it's a, a Carnolian or an Italian or a Caucasian, then you can have gentle strains in all of those as well. So um, often it's whatever you can get in your local area is what you'll, you'll start with. Louis would like to know what would you expect the price of a queen bee to be? The, um, the price of a queen bee seems to vary from usually in Australia here around the um, 20 to, to 30 dollar mark but it depends how many you buy and also you might be requesting to, to to uh, get a breeder queen, in which case it could be far more expensive than that if you're wanting specific genetics. Um, that say, say uh, that the queen's been tested by going through a, a process of testing for hygiene and you want to breed off that stock, then you might be expected to pay more for that queen. Mark says your hives are so beautiful, not only in manufacturing, but in nature they fit into the landscape so well. Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful area here and we're blessed to have, even in this hot, dry summer, the rains have come and, and the, the fields have turned green and the flowers are out, so it's fantastic. Luke says, hi Cedar, I'm in Victoria and have a hive that's been in my flow, a colony that's been in my flow hive for about five weeks. Is there an easy way to see it's time to add a super? I'm told during during that we don't normally get much honey, so best not to add a super. Yes, it depends a bit about what's ahead and the best uh, information is from your local beekeepers to find out in your area whether you're likely to get your bees starting to fill your super. It may be a, uh, it's still, still summer and there's still a lot of flowers around, so there's, there's a good chance you might get some honey in your super. The later you are in your season, if you live in a cold area like Victoria, then there's a long cold winter coming that the bees will need some stores to survive the winter. So it also may be the case that you'll need to check in on your bees, see if, if they are developing stores and if they're not, you may need to give them a feed of sugar prior to winter to make sure they've got enough stores to last until the spring flowers. So. Um, Best information from your local beekeepers, but there's, there's still plenty of summer left up here, and I'd certainly be adding a super in this location. Now, as to the timing, you want to make sure the bees are, have finished drawing out all the combs. So, as you saw here, this frame has no comb in it at all. So it's not ready to add a super. We want to make sure they're all drawn out and there's a lot of bees. You can also see, even though there's a lot of bees here, there's not very many over here. You want it to be packed with bees so when you add the super, they're straight up into it. If, they're, if, they're, uh, if the colony's looking a bit less like this, 
then wait some time until they really, really get those numbers up. Um, what's the best way to remove a stem? So if you follow the links on our first age page, we have some information about moving stings. There's various different methods, but people will often say to scrape sideways with something, a fingernail or a hive tool, and try not to squeeze the poison sac that might be still attached to the stinger and uh, pumping away. Troy's asking, do you recommend filling in new frames with waxed fillers? or do you recommend letting the bees fill the frame? So the question is about whether to supply frames like this and let the bees just hang their, their wax naturally, build their comb, and that's called naturally drawn comb, or whether to supply a wax foundation sheet and or a plastic foundation sheet through here. Now, to me, I prefer to just keep it perfectly natural in the brood box and let the bees do it themselves, and there's a few reasons for that. One is I believe there's a health benefit in letting the bees size the cells for themselves. So they can choose the cell size that matches them and they can raise their brood in those cells. Also, you're not introducing wax from other hives into your hive. Now, if you buy foundation, you are, that foundation has typically become from from commercial beekeepers uh, wax and while I'm not opposed to it some people are concerned that that wax may um, contain contaminants but it, you need to talk to who's supplying your wax whether that may be the case. There is some very nasty import foundation wax where it's not actually even wax it's petroleum uh, wax which I think would be a real shame to be mixing in with your natural wax. So, um, but the other reason is it's just less work, um, in my opinion. There's a bit more work in the hive, but that to me is enjoyable and fun as you make sure they draw straight on the first time they use it. But less work in going through that long, tedious task of wiring up the frames and getting the jumper leads on your car battery and melting those sheets of wax into your frame. So. So I prefer just to put it in like that, it's easy and quick, and let the bees do it, and uh, let the bees do their perfectly natural thing. Others like to use plastic foundation sheet through here, and it really depends on what you're trying to do. Now, one of the reasons people like to do that is to, to make a very rigid frame that you can spin as hard as you can in a centrifuge, and it won't fall apart. We don't need to do that. We've got a different extraction method with our flow frames. You don't need to spin the frames and uh, so therefore I see no need for the plastic foundation. I also find that the bees are, are very slow to use the plastic foundation in the brood box. Stephen's asking, do you take additional precautions returning the frame when you've seen the queen on it? I do. You don't want to squash the queen. That'll put the hive many weeks behind as they have to raise a new one if they have the resources to do so. That queen then 16 days later will emerge from her queen cell and then have to go on a mating flight. If you get poor weather that could be another few weeks. So a month down the track a lot of the foraging bees might have died off and your colony is much smaller. So it's a good idea to look after your queen. Try not to orphan her from the hive or squash her. Mark's in upstate New York. Which hive, such as a cedar, would be the best for all four seasons? So, in New York, the, uh, that we, have a, we have a lot of flow hive beekeepers in New York. And um, this is our most popular setup here, where we have the, the, the uh, cedar uh, this is the Western Red Cedar, which is one that you can keep looking beautiful outdoors for longer. It's naturally resistant. However, you are always fighting nature a little bit if you're trying to keep it looking this, these beautiful wood tones outdoors. They will tend to, tend to um, grey over time, so in order to keep it looking like that, you will need to rub it back with a bit of sandpaper, give it another oil every every six to 12 months just to keep it looking fresh. 
You may also like to paint it. If you're going to paint your hive, then we have a few options for you on our website, a couple of different wood options for you to use. You can also paint the cedar if you wish. The cedar is known as the very best wood in the world in terms of its long lasting and lightweight properties. So um, I'd recommend the cedar. And then we have a few different hive sizes. So we have the, the what we call the seven frame, which is applicable to the 10 frame Langstroth. And that's just the side size of your brood box. If you take a, a, a look um, up here, there's, there's seven frame sizes and six frame sizes like this. So the difference is just slightly wider. And the main choice people, the main reason people choose the size is to match their existing equipment. But um, also in the colder areas, if you're, if you're in the, the, the far north of, the, of North America, then the larger size is more popular uh, due to that's what's been conventionally done and it's got a little bit more honey stores to survive those long winters. Brian is wondering, how do you tell if the surrounding environment has enough flowers? So you can tell by watching the honey come into your hive. So if you have a look at the, the rear window of your flow hive, then let's come up here and have a, a little look at this. If, if you uh, have a look in here, you'll see that um, the bees at the moment, we've harvested this one. We haven't harvested this We've harvested this one, this one, and this one, and this one recently, but we haven't harvested this one. Now, because I can't see any more nectar going into these ones, I can tell there's not a whole lot of flowers at the moment. So we'll wait some time before harvesting any more frames from this hive. So um, that, that end frame view of the flow hive can give you a great idea. Sometimes you can even see the um, the nectar coming and going as the day progresses and that's an amazing thing you'll see them see them splashing their nectar all around the cells in that observation window and really drying it starting that process of condensing the nectar and turning it into honey if you um if you don't have a flow hive and you're trying to ascertain whether the honey is coming in or not you can either open it up and have a look get in your bee suit pull the frames out and see what they're doing, see whether they have nectar stores or whether they're eating their stores away. When they're eating them away, you'll see a sort of a checkered pattern both in the window here or in the, uh, in the frames themselves where there's capped honey and they're starting to choose different cells to eat the honey from. When, it's, when there's a nectar flow on, you'll see all of this glistening nectar in open cells and them starting to cap that and store that honey for later. Now, Another typical way beekeepers do it is simply by lifting the hive and seeing whether it's getting heavier. It's called hefting the hive, but what they do is they come up to their hive, they grab the back of it, they just give it a little lift and go, yeah, that's got a bit of weight to it, there's a bit of honey in there, and they keep doing that, and they, they gauge whether there's a lot of honey stores going into the hive. That's a typical commercial beekeeping way to do it. We'd better go back to our bees over here. We might start to put them away. If you've got any questions, put them in the comments below. We've got time for, for a couple more. Today we've been speaking about the beekeeper.org, which is a brand new initiative we've started. We've, uh, we've brought in contributions from many experts around the world to deliver really high quality beekeeping content for those that really want to immerse themselves fast track their learning and 50% of the profits from the beekeeper.org are going to habitat regeneration and protection. So it's twofold, it's to help educate those people who really want high quality beekeeping material and also it really does, does uh, uh, the job of, of one of our main missions which is to protect pollinators in the world and really look after the habitat that we need. When someone subscribes, do they get access to the entire content? So the way it's set up is it's delivered to you bit by bit 
and while you might be be uh, hungry to, to, to get it all at once, what often happens if you get a deluge of content at the same time, you'll end up um, in overwhelm and probably not get through all of it. So we've tried to stage it out in a logical order and we're continuing to make content and it will be a continuing ongoing B course designed to, to take you from knowing nothing about bees to being deeply immersed in the field, understanding intimately so many intricacies of the honeybee and of the broader pollinating, uh, pollinator world. So I'm um, really excited. I'm actually learning a lot from the beekeeper.org and it's really exciting to be bringing this project into life after working on it for a few years now. Raoul's in Uruguay and has four flow frames and he made his own hybrid four frame flow. Fantastic, in Uruguay, excellent. Excellent, we've got some, some good friends in, in Uruguay that have actually helped us out with our uh, beekeeping and um, flow hives here in Australia. Mark's in Victoria and in their second year of beekeeping, he says, we've harvested our flow frames twice this season and our colony looked very big, so we added a second brood box on top of the original brood box. We still have the flow frame on top of the two brood boxes. Is this okay? It is quite okay. You can, you can have multiple broods if you want or multiple supers. It depends which way. I tend to like to keep my colonies smaller as they get really busy and big and start bulging out the front. Take a split and get another hive. There's always people looking for new hives, but you're more than welcome to buy more, more supers or brood boxes from us to add to your hive. And you can either do that for, for um, perhaps you're trying to collect some comb or you want to just give them more space and keep a, a larger colony size. So thank you very much for, for all your questions today. And if you are interested in, in looking at our brand new initiative, thebeekeeper.org, go and have a look, see what you think. It's free to try and see what you think of our, our course material and how we're delivering it. We've tried to up the stakes a little bit, deliver really high quality information from the experts of the beekeeping world. Thank you very much for watching. If you've got any questions, put them in the comments below. Mm -hmm.